So hi, yeah. Bill. It's nice to see you and spend some time with you discussing a topic that we both love and are fascinated by, which is photography, of course. And it's impossible to start this conversation without um, bringing up your storied career at Life Magazine as editor-in-chief and uh, then as the founding editor-in-chief of Life.com. So my question to you is, what stays with you from that period? Is it the huge stories, the electricity, the camaraderie? What exactly? Hmm. Um, I think actually it's this deep sense. Uh, well, everything that you mentioned, yes. But if I, you know, if I had to say one thing, I guess I would talk about the deep sense of honor and humility that I felt working in the archives with some of the single greatest images of all time, the most iconic of all time, being able to talk with and sometimes work with um, some of the greatest photographers who made some of the most indelible images in American history, you know, to be able to shake hands with Gordon Parks, good God. So, so I could talk about I could talk about everything else you mentioned. I can certainly talk about the camaraderie and and how much I miss sitting around the table with my co-editors, coming up with story around. ideas. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. that was always great. Must have been quite an experience. Uh, the involvement must the involvement must have been really deep and ongoing. The involvement was deep and ongoing. The pressure when you're at the helm of a magazine with a brand like Life, you know, which everybody knows, and there's such a great responsibility, and there's so much heritage there that honestly, you really don't want to screw up. So, so yeah, there was a there was a lot going on, and also maybe we'll get into this later. I don't know where you want to take this, but. You know, it was a very interesting time to launch a magazine. Yes. And the way we launched it, which was into basically the weekend Sunday newspapers of 13, you right. know, 14 million. So, and that was at the time when Facebook and, um, you know, the digital world was ascendant. So it was, it was a hard time in terms of the media industry too. That was the third iteration, am I correct? Uh, let's see. It was at least the third. It was so it was in the 30s to 1972. And then yeah, I believe I think you're right. I think it was the third, the third and final. Okay. So that leads me naturally to the next question. How did you feel when in time came to turn the page? Were you ready to go? <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, when we closed Life Magazine, it was, it hurt so much, I can barely tell you. Really? I mean, oh, not only, you know, as the editor, are you responsible for the jobs and the security of the people who are on your staff, but yes. you've also closed the door on one of the greatest, I believe, magazine experiences Yes. Um, and I don't mean I don't mean the magazine that my team put out, but I mean um, you know life in its heyday um, that 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 the world has known, and to and to you know close the door on that was very difficult. At the same time, as the door was closing on the paper magazine, we were coming up with a plan for life.com, the yeah. digital the digital uh, child. <clears throat> which we can talk about. But I do want to mention, um, there's a terrific movie um, that was made, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, called The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Yes, it, yes. It's a remake. This one stars Ben Stiller. It takes place at Life Magazine as it's closing. And they actually used me as a consultant um, to, to work with between Time Magazine and yes. Ben Stiller's production right. to make sure they got everything right, especially the scene when the magazine closes, uh, which is something that I knew all too well. And were you part of the decision to close it? 
uh, it was done to me, I would have to say. It happened uh, for financial reasons at a level above my my pay. Yeah. I can just imagine the shock of it. And I remember, I remember very well. My my boss, who was the editor in chief of um, of Time Inc., called me into his office, and his name is John Huey, and he's from the South. And he said, "Bill, sit down. You're not going to like this." And then he told me, and he was right. I didn't like it. Well, what it's worth, it's happened to me in a different industry, so I know what you're talking about. I know how it feels. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, when you launched life.com, you stepped into a trove of 15 million, 20 million photographs that were never published and uh, stories that were killed and never, never published. Were you in a state of disbelief, of excitement, of bewilderment? What was your immediate response to stepping into all that? So, so you're right. We went into the Life Archive um, and had, you know, more than 12 million images scanned for the first time. Um, some of these, many of these, most of these had never been seen before because if Life would send a photographer, you know, let's say the great John Dominus, like, you know, Life sent him out to cover Steve McQueen. He spent three weeks with Steve McQueen, you know, uh, skinny dipping, motorcycle racing, shooting guns in the desert, uh, on and on and on. Um, three weeks shooting the whole time. And in the end, the story ran, I think, eight pages, 10 pages. And so hundreds of photographs, great photographs, were left on the cutting room floor, and we got to see them for the first time. So to answer your question, um, it was like a kid in a candy store. I mean, imagine loving the history of photography, photography, pop culture, American history, world history, and then somebody saying, look, some of the greatest photographers in the world have a surprise for you. Here are some photos no one's ever seen before. Yeah. But how much you, no matter how much you can do with these photographs, I mean, the joy of them is really in the sharing, you know? Well, that that's that is so, truer words were never said and when we launched life.com <clears throat> on april 1st it was if i'm not mistaken the 60th anniversary of the assassination of dr martin luther king and in advance of that day um my team and i had gone into the archives and had looked for some material surrounding that event and we couldn't believe what we found the day that King was assassinated, um, there was a young photographer named Henry Grzynski. He's not a young photographer anymore. Um, out, uh, I think he was in, I think he was in Alabama. And they said, hurry up, get to Memphis, get to the Lorraine Motel. He got in a car, you know, drove his ass off, got there and took these pictures that are so wonderful and so terrible and so intimate you know, we have Dr. King's blood on the ground in front of room 306. Yes. We, we, we have King's suitcase with his Bible and his shaving cream and his shirt. Anyway, these pictures had never been published because the editor, maybe correctly, felt like they would incite a riot. And so we were able to bring these photographs on, on the, of this terrible day, you know, all of these years later, um, to the public and and people went crazy for them. To your point, the sharing is the beautiful part. Yeah, and uh, I've seen them. Um, I've looked them up, and it, it's very hard to get over them. They are something quite quite incredible. So, those were stories that hadn't been published. Uh, tell me of a huge story that was published. That was published by us or by by life. Uh, you mean by way life back life in the in, day? In the, the 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 paper the paper magazine. Well, there's so many to choose from. I mean, you know, the the thing that always find that I always find one is that, being, the, the the one that you feel just happened yesterday because it's so big and you you were so much uh, impacted by it. 
Well, I don't know. I I always go back to the Larry Burroughs shots um, in the in the early seventies of Vietnam. Larry, Larry Burroughs was a staff photographer for life, <clears throat> who um, went 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 to Vietnam, went to war, and shot color. And his pictures are absolutely extraordinary. Um, there's one that's become quite famous. It's been it's been termed reaching out, uh, which is a, a black soldier and a white soldier. The white soldier's injured, and it looks like a um, you know a Renaissance painting. The lighting is so gorgeous, and yet there's blood everywhere and emotion yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know that's that's a that's a picture that um, uh, I think about a lot. Um, for 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 many reasons yeah it's interesting to say that these conflicts sometimes contribute some of the most spectacular images in photography well and also when you think about margaret bork white you know being with the first battalion of american soldiers who were liberating um prisoners from the death camps in in you know auschwitz and the photographs she got of the emaciated Jews up against the barbed wire, absolutely terrible conflict, obviously terrible time in human history and photographs that'll stop your heart. Yes. So would some of these photographers become as famous as they did had it not been for the war? <clears throat> um, I believe the answer is yes because these were the best of their generation. Life Magazine got the best of the best. And these were people who could find a story and make a story and find human interest anywhere. Like take Margaret Bork White, they sent her for the very first issue um, to shoot the Fort Peck Dam, which could be the most boring thing you could imagine. And yet, her cover is monumental and powerful and says a lot about American industry and optimism. And yet the pictures inside that she took of the very, very poor, you know, people who were toiling in the shadow of this dam and the dance hall and the and the and the food and the dust in their cracks in the face, you know, it's a, it's astonishing. So I, I think these people would have been famous um, irrespective of the conflicts that they covered. So tell me about uh, Paris Match. It was inspired by Life magazine, French uh, magazine. And uh, were the two magazines competing on some level? Uh, they were both uh, global publications. Um, I probably can't give you... <laughs> A, uh, uh, an educated answer about that. I mean, you know, before there was a life, there was a magazine, I believe, uh, well, it was published in Europe called VU, um, yeah, you yeah. know, and so, so, you know, life took some tricks from that, uh, you know, life, life hired Alfred Eisenstadt because he had worked for photo magazines um, in, in Europe. Um, so with competition from, from Perry Match and from, from Look, um, do I think it's uh, competition always sharpens the product? I do. I think, I think life, you know, got better because it had challenges and, and, and other magazines kind of nipping it at its heels. And certainly the photographers prospered because of that competition, because life would have to pay more if they wanted, uh, you know, if they wanted them on staff. Uh, I might have to pay more for single images so that Perry Match or Look wouldn't take them. So I think it's good for the ecosystem. Yes, I'm sure you had a subscription to Perry Match and they had a subscription to Life. No question. So, but you know, the uh, what do you think was the difference between the two uh, magazines in your view? Well, again, I'm not I'm not a deep student of Perry Match, but what I will tell you is that uh, it didn't cover America, obviously, the way life did. And yeah. what was going on in America, um, uh, you know, especially in the post-war years, was absolutely fascinating. With in, in this country, 
with the rise of suburbia, um, yeah, with yeah. with uh, race relations being what they were, yes. um, uh, with in the '60s with the assassinations of of our various uh, icons, um, with the with the sort of '60s hippie movement and drug movement. Yeah. So there was so much going on in this country um, that I think life owned. Uh, that I think Perry Match, you know, couldn't touch with an insider's hand. But there was also a, a difference in style. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Perry Match was more of the Robert Kappa type of style, the more more of the Magnum style. It, it was a different uh, look and feel, I'd say. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, Henry Luce, who founded Life Magazine and 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 Time Time Life. Um, was a proud American, um, mm -hmm. and he was an American booster. And although life absolutely covered many of the problems in America, especially with respect to race relations, you know, Luce was um, from the from the powerful elite. You know, he went to Yale. He had a lot of money. Um, so it, it is that, you know, there is a, a difference in, in character there. Yeah. He was an American booster. I remember the coverage of JFK's assassination. And of course, every person remembers exactly what, what, where they were when they heard of the news. It was, uh, it was a shocking event for everyone. You know, I'm 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 glad you mentioned uh, the assassination because it allows me to talk a little bit about um, a gentleman named Dick Stolly, who was my my mentor um, mm -hmm. at Life. Dick was the Los Angeles bureau chief. I'm pretty sure when Kennedy was assassinated, and he flew immediately to Dallas, and he was the reporter who beat out 200 of his comp of his competitors to secure the Zabruder film. Uh, Explain the, the, the Zabruder the, film for our audience. The Zabruder film is um, Super 8 color movie camera, you know, very old school, chick, 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 um, that um, a man, a family man named Ab Abraham Zabruder took standing on the uh you know on the sidelines where the assassination happened and he just happened very sunny to day it. on a very sunny day very sunny day in dallas and in um uh, and um you know he captured the whole thing on film he he got it developed immediately afterwards uh the fbi was knocking at his door uh hundreds of reporters had kind of gotten wind of this uh but it was dick stolly who managed to get the deal and secure Zapruder's trust um, for life. And so life, um, a couple of weeks later, because there was a, there was a delay, um, printed um, the assassination footage. Um, most of the frames, they deleted one of the frames because it was deemed violent. I think it was frame 33, I can't remember, um, in the magazine. And it was... Uh, an extraordinary moment in in publishing American publishing history. Mm. The picture of the bullet striking the president's temple. Yes. Yeah. Now, in the in the issue, it's so interesting to me. You know, in the in the issue um, that came out right after Kennedy was assassinated, there was also a huge story about um, Jacques Henri Lartige who uh, I think it was a 12 page story introducing this very young, he was a young man then, young man's photographs um, of, of the exuberant, you know, French uh, yeah. upper class lifestyle. Uh, he had a show, there was a show, I guess, opening at, in one of the, at the MoMA maybe, at the big museum in New York. And so there's the Kennedy assassination and Lartige in the same issue, kind of interesting. Yeah, Jacques-Henri Lartigue is one of my favorites. You know, he has the flair and and was the right photographer for the right time, for his time. And, and he had it from day one. His earliest yeah. pictures have it. Yeah. 
It's an incredible gift. Did Life magazine have a motto? Because I know that uh, pretty much did have one. Their motto was the weight of the words, the impact of the photographs. Did Life have a motto? Um, it did. Well, it had a positioning paper uh, uh, prior to the launch of the magazine. And perhaps uh, after we're done, I can send you a link to this and you can include yeah. the link because it's it's a brilliant piece of writing that Luce did with, um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting his name right now, but um, it'll come to me, um, uh, a poet. And it starts off with the famous words, to see life, to see the world. Um, you know, and it goes on to talk about, um, you know, to see the faces of the proud and the and the children suffering and the and the dark corners of the jungle and the and the mountains of the moon. And it's it's quite um almost a psychedelic um treatise on what the magazine would be about. And and I I read that uh, you know, a few times a year because it still held. So, you know, Archibald the, McLeish is the name of the poet. So pictures of I think. and families um, have an impact on you. you. You're very partial to that. You're because they they remind you of your own children and your own family. And uh, well, but I think I think that's I, I, I think that's the that's what's so effective about pictures is that you uh, it you know you don't need to read the language uh, French or German or English or Russian or whatever you look at a picture and even though that woman is eight thousand miles away and she's twice as young or twice as old as you you see that emotion in her face and it's like there's a red thread from her to you yes. and you feel that emotion and so yes with my kids it's true. But also, that's what I love about photography in general, is that you are given this gift, sometimes it only lasts a split second, of empathy yes. um, that connects yourself and the person in the photo. Well, there's a sort of wistfulness when you refer to these types of photographs in your New York Times article, The Strange Lure of Other People's Photos, which is a wonderful article. I advise everybody to read it. And you say, I remember those incredible days with my kids, days I thought would never end. And indeed, photography is inevitably about um, days and moments past. And is that part of your fascination with photography because it's about a moment's past, about that um, no longer? I, I Absolutely. I mean, you know, for me, I'm very focused on time going by, um, you know, on kind of a heavy, deep uh, and almost sad level. Mm, um, yeah. And so, you know, when I think about a photo, whether it's a photo that was taken professionally or like I wrote about in the story that you're mentioning, you know, sort of vernacular or found photos that I collect, they have a lot of meaning to me because, you know, the people in those old photos, they're not around anymore. In some yeah. cases, their children aren't around anymore. In some cases, there's nobody left on this earth who would recognize them um, because these pictures were taken 125 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I find that very poignant. Yeah, photographs are umbilical cords to the past. Exactly. Yeah. Um which separates photography from all other arts. For sure. You know. So, you know, anybody who loves photography loves photo books. I would assume if you love photography, you have to love photo books. And there are people who specialize in photo books and collect them and so on. I think there are Someone said 500 dedicated photo book collectors uh, mm. in the world. Um, but there are publishers, though, who are mostly interested in what sells, right? They're not interested in the art in and of itself. And they're 
only interested in photographers whose work sells. <laughs> and I remember you mentioning that some of them even ask about the size of the artist's social media following, right? You mentioned that. Yeah. They are not, you said, interested in experimentation. Is experimentation important to you when you look at new work? Does it have a special place? And uh, talk about no, it. I, I guess I don't like, I don't necessarily like experimentation for the sake of experimentation. Oh, I understand that. Yeah, of course. You know, but like, I'm working on a story now about a photographer named Todd Webb, who not a lot of people know, but he was great friends with Georgia O'Keeffe, and he was sort of a traditional um, frame up, beautiful, you know, warm, big hearted frames, well composed. And in 1955, he got a Guggenheim and uh, a fellowship, and he was um, traveling around America, taking pictures of America. At the same time, so was Robert Frank. And to look at their, also on a Guggenheim Fellowship, and to look at their photos uh, in comparison to one another, you know, Robert Frank's is all um, off kilter and high contrast and blurry, and there's something in the front of the frame. And But he wasn't doing that just to be experimental. No. He was doing that because he had a vision and he was communicating something and, um, you know, he went on to become a filmmaker. So these are very cinematic frames. Um, and so, like, in that case, uh, I love it. I love experimentation. You know, going back a little bit to what, to what you were saying before, you know, there's a lot of people that we think of as the great masters now, you know, William Eggleston, just to name one, or Stephen Shore, um, or Lee Friedlander, who in the beginning people thought it was just experimental bullshit and didn't understand, you know, why somebody would take a color photo of a tricycle, you know, uh, on, on a sidewalk. And, you know, honestly, the first time I looked at it, I was like, what's the big deal? And came to me later. So, you know, experimentation, that's, that's part of the risk. Sometimes the, the audience don't get it for a little while. You know, and I can understand why a publisher who's, especially now when paper's expensive and shipping's expensive and transportation from wherever you're printing, Italy or China or Germany is expensive, you know, that they have to be, that they want to be more conservative in their choices. I wish that wasn't the case, but um, but it is, unfortunately. Well, you know, that's why Radius book stands out as a number, yes. you know. Yes, they've solved that riddle, you know. Uh, it's a magnificent um, publisher. Terrific publisher. Yeah. So, of all the photographers that you run into, and those who have risen well above the fray, and have impacted on their time and their peers, are there any whose work simply does not? resonate with you wow so you're talking about photographers at the at the top level <clears throat> well um i don't know it's it's funny it's a, the way my brain works i don't really file away photographers who don't matter to me um if you name some I could I could give you a thumbs up. I can up tell you one that doesn't doesn't resonate with me in every Let's start there. you know cow towns is Ajay. A look at Ajay leaves me cold. Uh huh. With um, very with very few exceptions, some of his pictures I you know I really like. In general, his work leaves me cold. So it's it's so it's so it's interesting. I, I totally see what you're what you're saying, um, and and it, it sometimes it doesn't feel to me um close enough intimate enough but yeah. then but then i think about like i was just talking about todd webb you know ajay had a big influence on todd webb so yeah. not everybody so i love todd webb um yeah. so so there's that um so sometimes there are things in the picture or in the photographer that i understand 
I don't get, but I love the effect they had on somebody else. Well, that's something else. That's that's another thing. And we can talk about that. But what is it about this picture that touches you, excites you, surprises you, uh, or intrigues you? That's a whole other conversation. But there are photographers like that whose work uh, just I don't respond to more than one. But well, you know, you know um, Andre Gursky, um, he's somebody that uh, I admire the the scope and scale and the idea. It 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 you know, if I had ten million dollars, I, I I wouldn't buy one. Um, yeah. it, it doesn't speak to me like that. Yeah, but it's an interesting topic. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So, in the past few years. Fine art photography seems to have taken on a more personal and activist character, like cause-driven or identity-related work and so on and so forth. Has that had a discernible impact on photography and uh, on, on the direction of photography, formally or otherwise? Because um, I think you, run it, you run into it everywhere. Yeah. I think it has. I want to. I want to separate um, two things that you said. One is activist, and one is identity. Um, I, I think there's nothing new about if I'm under. You know, we may be defining these terms differently, but about activist photography because so many of the great life photographers were and Magnum photographers. You know, were activist in some way. They saw some. They saw some wrong that needed to be exposed. So let's put that over there because I'm. I'm all for that. The identity stuff is a different story. What I'm seeing a lot, so I, I help photographers make their photo books. Um, people, people come to me and they say, you know, can you help me uh, with the edit, with the sequencing, with the concept, with the text, whatever. I get a lot of young photographers. I see the work. So much, so many young photographers today are focused on identity, yes. whether it's gender, whether it's racial, whether it's economic. <laughs> Personally, I mean, I'm a, I'm all for people working out their problems, keeping a diary, uh, you know, do, doing art to explore that kind of stuff. Personally, I feel like young photographers should be looking outward before they look inward. It's like when I think about the number of 22 or 23 year old writers who have written successful autobiographies that that people care about. There are very few, very few. And I think the idea that uh, someone in their young 20s can come up with a meaningful body of work that's about themselves, and I mean meaningful to in, a, in, an outward, in an outward sense, to audiences, to collectors, to publishers, to galleries, um, I think it's unlikely. I think it takes a very special person to, to, to do that. So... I'm not sure if that answered your question at all. Well, you know, I think that regardless of what the topic is, uh, the artist has something has to have something to say, mm -hmm. and that's directly connected to the extent of one's personal experience. And at twenty, you know, there there is not much in store. Yeah, and you know, famous. Fa that's exactly right. You know, famous. Um, writing advice is write what you know. But yeah. when I when I hear that, I don't think, oh, I'm just going to write about Bill all the time because there's large parts of me that I actually don't know. And lots of introspection or therapy. But when it's right, when it's right what you know, I think you go out and you report it, you know, like, like, the gentleman who took this picture right behind me is named Richard Sherum. He spent a year, a solid year, in the Dallas Homicide Division reporting and taking photographs. Yes. And they are extraordinary. Yeah. Extraordinary. And so he didn't know about homicide before. So he got his he got his feet and his hands dirty and he did the reporting. There's something to be said about learning the topic about which you know you're communicating. Yes, and that's a very slow process. Yes, and you know, going back to the identity stuff, I know that every 
you know, every person with an iPhone um, takes selfies as much as anything else. Right. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that's helped anything either. No. So every Friday you introduce a different sometimes emerging photographer on Instagram. I do. You champion them. You champion their work. Can photographers today pierce through the noise without a champion? And what are the odds? Um, what a great question. Um, <clears throat> if the answer was yes, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. <clears throat> I do what I do. I find photographers who are under the radar or books that are under the radar, and I write about them because I think in this sea of selfies and food shots and um, uh, here I am at the beach, um, I think what I I think that's a lot of noise. And I think to be the signal to break through that is more and more difficult. And as there are more photographers these days, because everybody has one of these in their pocket, it is harder to break through. So I do, I value their work so much, and I really want to share it with people who haven't seen it or haven't thought about these things or haven't seen a style like that. Um, it's very meaningful. Like, I, here's just an example. Um, you know, some months ago, maybe it was a year ago, <clears throat> I came upon the photographs of um, Melinda Blauvelt, who was in her 70s now. Uh, when she was 22 or so, she was the first woman at the Yale uh, MFA photography program. And she studied under Walker Evans and she went on to have a teaching career and made some great photos. And then, um, you know, during, during COVID, but I'd never heard of her. During COVID, she spent a lot of time going back through her negatives because she had never done that. She was always on to the next assignment. And she found these wonderful pictures that she had made when she was 22, 23 on this remote island in Nova Scotia. And I ran those pictures with her permission and interviewed her on, on my Friday post. And they blew up. Um, she got a museum show in Nova Scotia for these photographs. All the a bunch of the people who she shot 50 years ago, they were kids then. They're, you know, late mid to see these photos of themselves and their families and their parents and their friends. And now she has a book deal with Stanley Park, uh, Stanley Barker books, and the book's coming out soon. And so I think I think anybody who can help good, dedicated, passionate photographers spread their work. Um, I, I think it's a good thing. So generally, how do you co come upon these emerging photographers? Do you seek them out? Do they knock on your door? Um... I have a lot of people knocking on my door. And honestly, most of the people who knock on my door, um, I don't, I don't choose, um, and and this is quirky, you know, sometimes I do, but usually it's not for whatever reason, the kind of pictures that I like, not to say they're not good pictures, but I kind there's something about finding them myself, which I actually really like. So I spend a lot of time in rabbit holes. And if I find a photographer that I like, then I, I might look for, oh, who likes that person or who does that photographer follow? And so, you know, I, I, I spend some time and Thank keep you. my eyes open. And what do you look for when you decide to check out some someone's work? Uh, what triggers your interest? Um, and in what form does it come? How does it? Well, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. For me, um, the emotional element is the single most, uh, I don't care if it's black and white or color. I don't care if it's, you know, Kodachrome or something else. Fuji. I don't care if it's square format or or vertical or you know whatever medium format. Um, to me, it has to do with is it hitting something universal that I feel in my bones. Um, today, in fact, I ran the story, the photo story of these pictures on my Instagram um, of these pictures that were taken in in I believe 1979 
by a, a then young woman who had just moved to New York City. And she took pictures of older 70, 80 year old women making their way in the city. They, they dressed very nicely, you know, they had their hair up or in, and, um, and yet there was this frailty to them, like a big gust of wind could knock them over. And I responded to that because I feel like, you know, we're all just hanging on to some degree. And to be able to capture that fleeting frailty in these people, I thought was something very beautiful. It reminds me of the consecrated phrase about the child within. Yes. Yes. What, what is that thing that is in your photo that's touching that's touching the child within, the parent within, um, the human within? Yes. When the needle moves inside your chest. That's it. I mean, or or sometimes for me, I feel it like I, my my throat clenches a little bit. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm, I try to tune into that and kind of listen to my body. And um, when I feel that, when I feel a universality, um, that's where it starts for me. So, you know, I think that the difference between a commercial photograph and a fine art photograph, and that's my point of view, is that the commercial photograph sends always sends you back or the viewer back to the work itself, where the fine art piece sends, sends back to the viewer himself. Sends very him. interesting. I, that that's very well said. I agree with that. You know, that's the difference. Yeah, uh, and those are the pictures that you gravitate towards. Then you yeah. respond. You know, the, the the whole the whole fine art thing is very interesting because you know, um, when you look at life magazine photographers those were not shot as fine art no you know? I don't, yeah they, they, they were shot as journalism now they're fine art um and and so things can change that way too which i like so the question is are great photographs are they presents from the unknown <laughs> uh, because they are a fraction of a second and it's not the same Picture. Yeah, I don't think they're from the unknown. I mean, I think there's a muse, but when you talk to a great photographer, a really great photographer, and you see how they consistently look at the world and how they see the world in what kind of layers and what kind of emotions, um, that's coming from a place that's that's within them, I, th I, I think. Okay. Um. You like Instagram, obviously. There are many things about it I like. There are some things about it. Obviously, <clears throat> of course. But... Well, but, I, but I will say this. A lot of people complain about the ads. Yeah. The ads don't bother me. I yeah. understand. They don't. Because I understand having worked um, in a, you know, in a media industry that was dependent on ads. Well, if you yeah. don't have the ads, you don't have the product. So... Uh, it's, it's something matter, I. It's a, it's a matter of balance because I get more it's a matter of balance, ads, more ads than 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 photography. Uh, uh, that that that's yeah, that's unfortunate. That's not a problem. I don't like the videos on Instagram. Too many videos for me. Oh. So how much time do you spend a day on Instagram? Um, on Friday, I spend a lot because I, I tend to respond to everybody's um, comments or notes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe a couple hours on Friday. I don't know, maybe an hour a day. So your current work on photography, what is it that you, which part of it do you spend most time on? In terms of what? <clears throat> well, in the course of a regular day, you, you spend a lot of time on photography of various aspects. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. <clears throat> what is it that you spend most time on? So I'm helping right now. Um, I have three photographers that I'm helping make, make books. So, and they're at various different stages. Um, so, uh, you know, with one, I'm working with uh, the lawyers to work out some stuff in the contract. You know, with another, we're, we're still working on the sequencing. Yes, yes. Uh, 
And with the third, we're sort of getting things off the ground and, and discussing what should this book be. So that's something I'll do a couple of hours a week, maybe five hours a week. Right now, um, I'm, I'm writing about um, a couple of uh, photo stories. One, I alluded to earlier, this, this, um, uh, the Todd Webb uh, and Robert Frank, there's an exhibit happening at the Museum of Modern, um, sorry, Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Um, and, and that's showing both Frank's work and Todd Webb's work um, taken at the same time. And so I'm writing um, for a photo magazine called Blind. I'm writing a few stories about that. Um, I just finished a story for New Mexico Magazine that I'm really excited about. Um, I, you know, through my searching, I, I came across this terrific photographer named Alex Harris, who's, Alex has gone on to become a professor, he's now retired, but a professor at Duke, and he started Double, uh, Double Take Magazine, and he's in all the great museums, and he's just a wonderful man, a wonderful photographer. Um, but I learned that 50 years ago, when he was 22, when he was a kid, he moved out to a tiny village only half an hour from where I live in New Mexico and began shooting the older people there and then inside the houses. And he made a few books and, and um, you know, he lived there for years. And so I invited him to come back and the two of us would kind of retrace his steps um, 50 year, exactly 50 years later. A pilgrimage. A pilgrimage, exactly. Um, and so we, we, we did that. And you know, we met um, back in 1972 or three. He shot a 10-year-old boy, and we found that 10-year-old. Um, and so it was a really wonderful journey back in time. Uh, so that'll be a New Mexico magazine in, in October. Having helped so many people over time, is there one thing that you found that cannot be taught? Huh. Um, curiosity. Ah, yes. Um, I also think it's hard to teach empathy. Like you, you, yeah. you know, you, you got it or you don't. Um, I mean, you can learn to spot empathy in a picture, but I don't know if people can learn how to feel something. Maybe they can. What do you have to be open to it? You have to be open to it. Right. If you're not open to it, game no. over. It disappears. Yeah, yeah. Which is part of the problem with so much of our politics today. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people uh, lacking in any empathy for their fellow humans. And or themselves, actually. And or themselves. <laughs> so when you look back over your shoulder and you look at the journey that led you to this very moment, Mm. What is it that you see? What comes up for you? <laughs> wow. Um, when I was in sixth grade, I was the uh, I ran I co-ran the uh, printing press in my elementary school. So I think I've always been someone who likes to tell stories and likes to share emotional truths. Um, that's, you know, what I told people when I worked at Life Magazine, you know, when I was the editor, what I said to the staff was, when people finish reading the story that you have shot or designed or written or edited, I want them to feel something. Now, it could be joy, it could be regret, it could be anger, I don't really care. But I want there to be an emotion, I want there to be an emotion tied to that. More about the heart than the head necessarily. So I think when I look back, I think about a career in trying to make people feel things a little bit more. Well, feel, simply feel, yeah. Is that an honorable career then? Well, I'll let other people decide. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's it's you know it 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 is satisfying to me, but um, 
you know, I'm sure I'm sure Roseanne Barr is satisfied with her career too. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a wonderful path that you have followed and that you continue to follow. And that mostly you share with others, and like we discussed earlier, the share the sharing is everything. Sharing sharing's all of it, you know. So thank you, Bill, for spending time today. You know, I do. Can, can I mention one other thing? It's Good. not. It's not necessarily photo related. It, it is. It is about this sharing and small emotions. You know, yeah. the the my wife and I did a book um, in 2018 called What We Keep, and we went around the country and yeah. we asked uh, hundreds of people, famous. You know, Melinda Gates, Mark Cuban but also just regular butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers about the, about the one object in their life that holds the most emotional significance and why. And we had pictures of those things that, that they often took. Um, but that's one of the things that, you know, in some cases they had never talked about this object before or had never talked about it in this context. And the idea that an object holds these emotions and these stories um, and that we were able to share these very human emotions through this book and through these interviews um, is very meaningful to me. And I think that's sort of a continuation of what you were talking about. You chose the two sheets of paper that were taped together. They were scribbled over in German. And what did it say? Yes, it said Ergenwo, which means anywhere. That's right. Which, you know, German is not a language I speak, but I was hitchhiking before the wall came down uh, with my friend Fred in Germany. And, you know, we were kids and we just had this sign that said Ergenwo, anywhere. We don't care. We're just here for the journey. So. So is Taos your anywhere? Uh, great question. It is. It is. I, I finally arrived to anywhere. <laughs> so you've uh, completed the circle. Yes, I found my place. I can't tell you how wonderful it was chatting with you. Well, thank you so much. Really, uh, it was a fascinating conversation. It was a wonderful uh, com conversation. It was a very touching conversation. And my needle did move. Oh, good. Well, I, I appreciate the questions you asked, which um, were not common and were very um, pointed and smart. So thank you for that. Thank you. And till next time. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye.